this week on Vaticano. Discover with us what the Holy See has in common with Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world. Visit with us the hidden treasure in Rome of the Church of St. Jerome of Charity and meet an Illinois priest who's been working on the canonization cause for the first Catholic televangelist. Discover this and more on this week's Vaticano. Indonesia is the largest Muslim country by number of faithful in the world. Catholics represent around just 3% of the total population of 250 million inhabitants. Despite the relatively small number, the Catholic community is well-rooted in Indonesia's multi-religious society. Ambassador Antonius Agus Suryono continues the Indonesian diplomatic tradition with the Holy See that started about 70 years ago. What we inform our government and people in Indonesia, the importance of values in diplomacy, like justice, like uh, unity, like uh, religious freedom. Uh, this, these are very important values to be uh, developed between those two countries. Holy See Indonesia relations are marked by promotion of peace and interfaith dialogue. In 2018, the Vatican's Ethnological Museum began hosting a permanent exhibition of a Buddhist temple, Borobudur Garden. This exhibition is a gift of the Indonesian government and was realized by way of Muslim donors. The relation between Buddhism and then Indonesian government and then uh, Holy See Vatican is very important and symbolically it is important for our uh, uh, unity, our tolerance among religions in Indonesia. Interfaith dialogue is rooted in the motto of the country, which is unity in diversity. But it's not an easy task to maintain peace and unity in a country with more than 300 ethnic groups. There are at least two kinds of threats. First, we call it sectarian uh, conflicts. And secondly, uh, extremism and radicalism. But before I proceed, I just would like uh, to say that when we talk about extremism and radicalism, basically it doesn't belong only to one religion. The Holy See is actively contributing in the fight against religious radicalism. Last month, the Vatican participated in the conference Interreligious Dialogue, the Asian Perspective, organized by the Indonesian Embassy to the Holy See. With regard to the seminar on interfaith dialogue, uh, unfortunately uh, that Indonesia now uh, became uh, the coordinator of Asian ambassadors to the Holy See. So I was lucky to be appointed as a coordinator and by uh, initiating this idea, the, the main idea was how to have interreligious dialogue from the perspective of Asia. Because we know that uh, different culture will have different, uh, how do you call it, different view on how to, to uh, develop the dialogues. The ambassador says that the Asian perspective is exactly this, to build up unity based on a common uniting factor, our humanity. The ambassador is Catholic himself. In addition to the promotion of interfaith dialogue and peace through the official state role, he also leads the Indonesian Catholic community in Italy. First of all, we had an opportunity to exchange of views with 36 bishops from Indonesia during, uh, we call it, ad limina. At the time, we discussed one important thing, that is how to protect and to, uh, how do you call it, to support 1,521 priests and nuns from Indonesia who are in Italy. Indonesia has been visited twice by Roman pontiffs and now awaits the visit of Pope Francis. As I could recall at the time, uh, St. Pope John II, during the Mass in Yogyakarta, he, he mentioned one thing that I, I could uh, remember, the importance 
of tolerance and unity in 1989. Tolerance and unity, especially, of course, among uh, different uh, religions. During my credential presentation in, in 2016, when I met uh, Pope Francis, I mentioned about our visit, uh, about our invitation, and uh, he said that, okay, I will do my best to visit your country, but we are not so sure up, up to now, but we do hope that next year uh, Pope Francis will be visiting Indonesia, but I personally also hope that President Joko Widodo will be also visiting uh, Vatican. The World Council of Churches and the Holy See are uniting to promote world peace. Welcome back, you're watching Vaticano. In a world affected by war and crises, education for peace is a part of the answer. Violence is ever more visible and present in mass media, even inciting fear and hatred. There's a need for peace. And the WCC Holy See meetings are pointing to two documents that might illumine the path forward. We are very happy for having been invited in the World Council of Churches for launching the document on education for peace and at the same time presenting the documents signed in Abu Dhabi last February the 4th by Pope Francis and Grand Imam Ahmed At-Tayyib on human fraternity uh, for world peace and living together. So the event of the presentation of this joint document has been very important because the contents and suggestions addressed particularly to Christians in order to create a spirit of unity and ecumenical approach for promoting peace in the world through uh, an educational uh, program and proposal has been very effective. Participants also examined the structural roots that have led to the disruption of world peace. The main objective of our joint document is that we are convinced that uh, if we want to change the world, if we want to transform our societies, if we want to change also our communities religiously, we have to encourage and to promote education. Educating the educators and educating uh, children, young, and even adults in order to be more aware about the necessity of peace today in the world. Blessed are the peacemakers, because they shall inherit the kingdom of God. And therefore, as Christians, we also join hand in hand uh, with our fellow Christians all together, inviting people of other religious tradition in order to uh, build a better world by uh, proposing to institutions, to people who are working in social service, to authorities in order that uh, in curricula, in the media, in uh, education, in our relationships, that peace may always prevail as a gift God has given to all humanity. The meeting is the message, in a sense, encouraging a common Christian effort to promote peace worldwide. St. Jerome of Charity, a small church hidden in the back alleys of the historic center of Rome. Although it's not very well known, this church preserves a unique treasure inside. Si lo 
cuarto, aquí no hay una iglesia, hay una casa. Eh, la casa pertenece... In the fourth century after Christ, there was no church here, but a house. Now, this house belonged to a Roman matron named Paola, who was later proclaimed a saint, a pious person very interested in everything that had to do with the Bible. In fact, she had a Bible circle. The Pope entrusted St. Jerome with a mission to obtain the original manuscripts of all of the books of the Bible, Old and New Testament, and then to make a translation of those original manuscripts into Latin. When Jerome came to Rome to consult with the Pope and see if the documents he had obtained were original or not, where was he staying? Well, here. In the 16th century, another very important saint, Saint Philip Neri, enters this story. Muy importante, que es San Felipe Neri. Filippo Neri vivió aquí. Philip Neri lived here for 33 years. He was ordained a priest and was assigned to this church where there was a community dedicated to charitable works. That is why it was called San Girolamo de la Carità. A obras de caridad. Por eso. Eh, se llamaba San Girolamo de la Carita. En la capilla eh, que tenemos a mi derecha, la Gloria de San Filipe In the chapel on my right, known as the Chapel of the Glory of Saint Philip Neri, represents a mystical experience that the saint had. Saint Philip had this experience in the catacombs of Saint Sebastian on the day of Pentecost. He lived the Holy Spirit inside of him in a profoundly intense way. He said that he felt like a fire had dilated his heart. That's why the heart is also represented in the chapel. But the real treasure of the church is the Spada Chapel. The chapel is an intimate place where two of the most important members of the family rest. On the right is Giovanni Spada, close collaborator of Pope Innocent IV. On the left, Bernardino Spada, an influential cardinal who lived in the 17th century. The two cannot be approached as two angels support a veil of marble that prevents access. The chapel, as well as being a burial place, was a way to show the prestige of the family. It was for this reason that Virgilio Spada, who designed it, decided not to fresco the chapel, but to use different types of marble, a much more expensive material. The importance of the family is further emphasized by the placement of two other figures, Saints Francis and Bonaventure, next to the six ovals that represent the ancestors of the family. The absence of columns and other architectural elements shows that the chapel wasn't designed by an architect, but rather drawn by an artist. And it's that characteristic that makes this place special. This work is a unique wonder. Indeed, there is no other like it in the city of Rome, nor in the rest of the world. In a few moments, we'll introduce you to Monsignor Richard Sozman, the Vice Postulator for Venerable Fulton Sheen's canonization. More on Vaticano begins now. to think well, one has to have principles that are independent of space and time, by which one can live. We know that these principles exist, and we know there's such a thing as truth, simply because there's a logos, there's an intelligence behind the universe. The first Catholic televangelist, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, will soon be beatified. The Vatican announced the news on July the 6th after the conclusion of the dispute over the transition of his relics from the Archdiocese of New York to the Diocese of Peoria, Illinois. 
vice postulator for Archbishop Sheen's canonization cause, visited our studios in Rome to give more details. The family in the diocese wanted the tomb to be in Peoria uh, so that it could show that, uh, so visits there could show that uh, it was honoring uh, Bishop Sheen. Mm -hmm. And he expressed his wish to be buried in New York, correct? Well, in his will, last will and testament, he had put uh, a cemetery in Queens or Brooklyn, I can't remember which, or perhaps the Bronx, where there was a section for priest. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, he was very self-effacing. He just said, well, bury me with the priest. Mm -hmm. Cardinal Cook is the one who offered to the family uh, to be buried in the crypt of the archbishops, which was a great honor. It was in St. Patrick's. In St. Patrick's mm -hmm. Cathedral, but it's inaccessible, and uh, mm -hmm. someone who's blessed uh, or who's a serious candidate for sainthood, you really need to to be able to gauge by the number of people who turn out that there is popular devotion, mm -hmm. and so that was one of the that was one of the steps. You know, if you trace it back uh, to Peoria, it was Peoria that led his cause, even though he sort of lived most of his life and died in New York. Uh, because the archdiocese decided that they wouldn't pursue the cause. Right, right. Why, why didn't they? Well, the same question was asked me of the Cardinal uh, Prefect of Saints in 2002 when we requested uh, the competence be changed so that we could do it. And he said, why is it? I said, well, they have six or seven candidates they're trying to investigate, and I said, we have only one. I said, in New York, they're all saints, and we only have one in Peoria, so uh, that's, that's why we can move ahead with it. And indeed, you know, uh, it's said that the larger archdioceses get bogged down with all kinds of other things, mm -hmm. not just causes for sainthood. And so uh, the more smaller dioceses are able to handle them much more quickly and efficiently. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what exactly was your position? How did you help to I was the diocesan case? judge or the Episcopal delegate, and so I uh, handled all the canonical and everything else regarding the cause for Bishop Jenke uh, after it was undertaken. That was concluded in 2008 when we sent 7,000 pages and three copies of the 67 books uh, over here uh, to the Congregation for Saints. People are always interested in the miracle that leads to a beatification. In this case, uh, his a miracle was local. It was there in the Diocese of Peoria. Can yes. you tell us about it? Uh, we, we actually had three miracles fully instructed sent over, but that was so astounding. It was the last one, but it was so astounding. A baby there was, uh, was born at home, James Fulton Engstrom. He was meant to be a home delivery in the country on the farm where they lived, and there was a midwife, a uh, physician's assistant, I believe, standing by, born without breathing. Uh, in the half hour that it took the ambulance to come, they did what they could, still not breathing. 20 minutes to the hospital, Children's Hospital of Illinois, not breathing. There for 15 minutes, and uh, when not breathing, the doctors turned away, said, he's not alive. And he breathed spontaneously. In that moment? Yes, and the parents had dedicated the pregnant, or put the pregnancy under the protection of Bishop Sheen. When he was baptized by the father at home in emergency baptism, he gave, gave him the name James Fulton. And so it was very clearly in everybody's understanding, even the doctors and nurses, okay. uh, something that is unexplainable. <laughs> so, and when they, uh, you know, they take blood when you arrive at the hospital and, and uh, uh, when he began to breathe and they tested the blood to type it, you know, all those things they do And the lab said, you've got the wrong blood. No, it's the right blood. Well, they found out it was right blood but it was the blood of a dead person. Archbishop Sheen, back when he had these major television programs uh, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, he had millions of people watching these programs. Mm -hmm. And you know, he was producing them as an auxiliary bishop in, in the Archdiocese of New York. Uh, he won Emmys, he was on the cover of Time Magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think made him so popular? He spoke to the heart, he spoke Jesus Christ. Uh, often he would speak what might be unpopular positions, but he, he spoke clearly to people. He decided to speak to a sophomore level in high school when he, he was 20 years on the radio before he was 58 when he began the TV show. Uh, and uh, so he addressed himself so he could be understood, but really with the very profound philosophy and theology underneath. And did you know of him? Uh, did you watch his shows at any point in your life? I think well, you it's a and time. certainly. Uh, we listened to tapes or watched uh, some of the video tapes at the time. But also, uh, um, he was, our diocesan newspaper, when he would come to town, would have an article in the paper, often, you know, to, what is Bishop Sheen doing now? And my mom would point those out to me when I was a kid. So. Did you ever meet him? No, no. And, uh, but I fear, I, I feel that I know him well. <laughs> have you watched all his shows? Uh, not all of them, but many of them, yes. Was that a part of the postulation process? Because you have to document everything. Well, yes, the, the Theological Commission has to look at all the written works, certainly, and then uh, they made a, a kind of a general estimation of the, uh, the tapes and the 
what was broadcast. We didn't have all the tapes, but uh, Captain Kangaroo actually was looking for his tapes in a warehouse in New Jersey and came to Propagation of the Faith and said, oh, do you want these Bishop Sheen tapes? They were next to mine. They're about ready to throw these things out. It seems to be a very close uh, sort of uh, connection between the two mm. people, you know, Mother Angelica, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, both major presences on, on air, uh, catechetical presences, mm -hmm. inspiring people to live sure. Catholic lives. Do sure. you see that connection? I do, and I think without what Bishop Sheen did, uh, I mean, that gave a foundation for what Mother Angelica was able to do a few years after his death, mm -hmm. you know, with founding EWGN and all the important work that she did, mm -hmm. amazing work. And how is it that he made the sort of great use of that means of modern communications media, and how can that be inspiring to bishops today? Well, he was the first preacher on radio of any kind, any faith, and uh, as I said, he was on for 20 years. They also said in the office, in the Propagation of the Faith office in New York, because he was national director of Propagation, that's why he was auxiliary of New York and lived there uh, from when he was about 58. They said he was constantly on the lookout for the latest technology to be able to use it and uh, simplify what they were doing and to reach more souls and more people. Mm -hmm. So he uh, uh, made records and when people in faraway places said they wanted to study the faith and he couldn't meet with them or you know with uh, any of his staff. He would make records and ship them off to them to study the faith. Uh, um, he, uh, all kinds of different technologies that they would come, come around, uh, he would use. And I, I think that's important for us to realize, as you all do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I, if you look to a figure like him, I mean, us in our work as uh, sort of Catholic uh, media communications professionals, we look to you know, saints and, you know, in this case, blessed as sort of examples. Uh, what is it that uh, beyond sort of for our work here that people should be praying for um, Fulton Sheen's intercession for? Well, the two, two of the miracles that we sent were for infants, and so uh, uh, he seems to have uh, 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 intercession uh, with infants, and one was a very elderly person. Um, uh, conversions, I think that's, a, 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 you know, parents who want their children to return to the church. I think uh, he'd be very good for that, you know, a very good intercessor for that too. Mm. Will those other two miracles that weren't accepted to advance the cause at this point, will they be considered for the future or you've got to have a new miracle that no, happens? No, the new miracle has to be after July 5th, 2019. <laughs> Any concern? That was the decree uh, for beatification. I mean, if he's already got three, there's probably not too much concern. I'm not concerned at all. As soon as I started working with the cause, there were so many miracles that people reported, including when he was alive. You know, the miraculous things that happen, are they certifiable? Well, God brings so many miracles into our lives every day. Well, with the Eucharist, that, uh, yeah, most miracles aren't certified, but I have no doubt we'll find very soon miracles that are certified that we can uh, do the diligence and work through uh, for canonization. Can I ask you, uh, you know, Ida Wittin has seen across the globe, um, there'll be people watching this who are from all parts of the world. Uh, those miracles, favors, you know, through the intercession of Fulton Sheen, are they strictly, in your experience, based in the United States? No, in fact, when I was at the Vatican, I would buy Fulton Sheen's works in six or seven languages and give them to a priest. Uh, bishops, cardinals who were from those places. And many remembered Bishop Sheen from that time, and many spoke about his positive influence in their lives. Uh, many, many of the senior Italian clergy told me that, including cardinals. And uh, uh, I've heard the same from French and Polish mm -hmm. and uh, Germans and Spaniards. So uh, yes, his appeal was definitely global. Uh, and uh, so um, I think this beatification is exciting for everyone. When is it going to happen? You said in the Sometime next six months? in the months? next six months. <laughs> and uh, another question is, will this be the biggest event in the Diocese of Peoria's history? It might be the biggest event in the Catholic Midwest <laughs> history, so we'll see. But it will be a very big event, yes. Mother Teresa's visit in 1998, that was a big event, too. John Paul II's so, visit to Des Moines, Iowa, oh, too. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. true, that's true. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Monsignor. Sure. Well, thank you all. Yes.